But let's just talk about uh, the Middle East, shall we? Because obviously this continues. Um, and, and overnight, there are a number of headlines. Uh, Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, has ordered a, a plan. Essentially, what he's saying, he's ordered the military to develop a plan to evacuate civilians from the city, this last neighbourhood where Gazans have found refuge. He wants to defeat the remaining Hamas battalions. He went further to say it's impossible to achieve the war objecting of eliminating Hamas and leaving four Ham Hamas battalions in Rafa. Now there are something like 1.5 million people now who are uh, who have fled who will be caught up in this and at the same time we've also got ongoing uh, troubles we've seen uh, that settlers are, are being targeted in in other parts inclusive including the uh, West Bank as well and the EU are wading into that I'm just wondering in terms of where we are Hamas sets out what they want as a resolution that's been rejected by Israel. Where do you stand on where we are? And particularly with the US saying it will not back any sort of unplanned offensive in Rafa. It's a complicated solution. I'm just wondering, does it, Israel retain the moral high ground? I think it's a tragedy, whichever way you look at it, for all the civilians involved, whether that's the ordinary Gazans who aren't Hamas, who have been forced to flee their homes through shelling. And let's be honest, have been forced to live under Islamist tyranny since Hamas violently took over the Gaza Strip in 2007. They took over from Fatah, the Palestinian Authority faction, the more moderate ones. And, you know, these people threw their co-religionists, their fellow Palestinians, off buildings and violently took over the Strip. Since then, they have used infrastructure projects to build these terror tunnels. I think I've read one report that said they're more extensive and more numerous than the entire London Underground Network. Mm. And this was going on with international aid organisations. Well, I was about to say, and also not knowing anything. Well, and, uh, and apparently siphoning off aid money yeah. as well to, to pay for those tunnels as well. But just in terms of where we are, how, how does this resolve from here? Because obviously you've got the US trying to broker some sort of deal, you've got other countries involved in this, but is there a deal to be done? I mean... A deal could be done if Hamas decided to release the hostages, which they took on October the 7th. The conflict could end then, um, but they're choosing not to do so, and they're trying to cling on to power. I think the recent Israeli military offensives around particularly the Khan Yunus area, where a lot of them are being reported to be ha holding out, um, have put serious pressure on the organisation's leadership, and there's reports of fractures within those of some of the leadership abroad wanting a more hardline approach, mm. um, dragging out the conflict even further, and some of the ones in Gaza wanting to reach some kind of accommodation that might allow them to survive or to flee abroad to a different country. Charlie, where do you stand on this, and particularly with, with a view to international support from different communities as mm. well? Because obviously you've, you've got this Israel's plan for, um, for Gaza, which was released, I think, in January of this year. And they were very clear. They wanted a multinational force to rebuild Gaza. They wanted Egypt to have some sort of role. They wanted Israel to be in charge of security and some sort of Palestinian council. Then, of course, Hamas has come back and said, no, we don't want any of that. Israel's rejected what they say. And um, they've also said that, uh, essentially, they want total victory in Gaza. Mm. You can't square the two. No, I think the international side of this is actually the most interesting element because I don't want to sound like Putin in his recent Tucker Carlson interview, but if you'd give me 30 seconds just to briefly talk about the history <laughs> of that area of the world. Um, you know, in 1948, obviously, Israel, the state of Israel in its modern form was created. And yeah. since then, um, bearing in mind America has been the world's sort of hegemon, you know, the global police force, um, basically underwriting all uh, global security, Israel has been the only country within America's sphere of influence that has been allowed to behave in an openly nationalist and ethnocentric way. If there were any countries in, in Europe, for example, which is also, of course, essentially a vassal, uh, vassalized area to the American kind of global order, if they were to talk in the terms that the Israeli government do or behave, in the way that the Israeli government has, they'd be shut down immediately. Now, it's, it's very interesting with that in mind to see Antony Blinken, Secretary mm. of State, basically saying to Israel, like, oh, come on, lads, yeah, well, like, he's, calm he's, down a little he's bit. He's pushing them back. Yeah, and that, I mean, that I think is a real, this is a turning point. You know, America, uh, Israel's greatest ally, you know, biggest supporter, 3.8 billion pounds a year in military aid, the highest amount that uh, America gives to any country, saying, 
like and, calm and down. So that's me, huge. Well, let me ask you, why is Blinken pushing back? Is it mm. because he believes it's fundamentally wrong, or is it because actually there's political pressure being applied to the United States to say it is fundamentally wrong? <sighs> I don't want to sound too cynical, but I can't. I can't believe that the American government really believe believe. I don't think they have a moral compass. I don't think this is about morality, fundamentally wrong or anything else. I think this is first and foremost an issue of optics. I think that it's extremely, you know, if, if Israel is to be seen, are seen to be this extremely aggressive and you know, uh, killing thousands of innocent people type uh, power. That's bad for America because uh, you know it tortures their reputation on the world stage. Yeah, and, and would you agree with that? I, I mean, think, it, do you think it's political pressure on the United States? I think it would be remiss to not consider the domestic pressures that uh, Biden is going to be under. I think particularly in the state of Michigan, where there's a large Muslim population, Michigan's a very important swing state that he's going to have yeah. to win. I do not believe that it's not a consideration that's taken into account by them. And also, you know, they want to stop a big, big ongoing war and also to stop any potential escalation of things going into <coughs> Hezbollah and Lebanon and Iran other Iranian proxies destabilising the region. No, I, I actually disagree with that. I would say that there are significant elements of the American government that want this mm -hmm. to continue and want it to escalate. You hear Chuck, uh, mm -hmm. no, uh, Mitch McConnell, rather, um, you know, every day for the last 20 years has said, bomb Iran, bomb Iran, bomb Iran, you know, and any excuse to uh, escalate this conflict, I think that neocons like him will take. Well, and, and of course, it's a very polarised world in the it States. It is, and actually, but just picking up on the point that you made, America is one of the most nationalistic countries in the world in terms mm. of protecting their own position. If America or the UK or Europe had had Hamas come across their borders and slaughter their citizens, kill their babies, behead people, mm -hmm. rape their women, take hostages, believe you me, mm -hmm they would yeah. be bombing the hell out of the Middle East right now. And let me just say, actually, that in, in part, you know, in a strange sort of way, I do kind of, I understand the mindset that Israel are, are in right now. Because if I, as you said, if I saw this same sort of thing happening on my doorstep, which, frankly, you know, maybe we're getting close to, given the, uh, you know, marches that are happening every single weekend in London that are pro-Hamas, which is kind of crazy to see in England, you know, why is that mm. happening? Um, if that happened, I think the, the level of, I mean, the, the, Israel's bloodlust, you know, when push comes, you know, when you really think about it, when you really get down to it and you're honest with yourself, you can kind of understand it. Now, that's not to say that what they've done is justified, because I don't think it is, because I do think that Israel have gone way beyond what was necessary. They've killed tens of thousands of people. Now, of course, those statistics According are coming out of Hamas. Hamas. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But I think if you look at the footage coming out of this area, I mean, the fog of war is such that you can never be sure about oh, these I things. But it's even the aggression of the IDF say... and the Israeli government. Yeah, you can believe it. I'd push back to say blood loss because I think this is a very, very complicated military mm. operation. This is op military operations in some of the most densely populated areas mm. where Hamas has deliberately built tunnels mm. inside civilian areas. Indeed, inside but there are still 1.5 million people caught yes, in the middle of it. This, and this is the tragedy of it all because Hamas has forced this operation knowing exactly what's going to happen and knowing that they're going to maximise... So Israel says there'll be evacuation of these 1.5 million people. Where are they going to be but evacuated Hamas won't to? Hamas that happen, Well, David, that may be well. true, but where are they going to go? They've set up humanitarian safe areas outside of these where they're encouraging people to go to. And, you look, it's complicated. It's a tiny area that's overly militarised. You've got terror tunnels going inside schools, inside UN facilities. All these areas but, are but, meant but to so, OK, let's say they get them out, even if Hamas allows them out, which I agree, I don't think they would, but you get them out, and then basically you bomb the heck out of what is left. Then you have to rebuild the whole thing, and fine. they want a multinational force to do that. That's fine. But, but I'm just wondering what the optics are from other countries who I think are trying to step back. And Where say, are the optics? Uh, Where are the optics on saying, hang on a minute, let's have a four-and-a-half-month ceasefire, let's have a ceasefire? No, no, I agree. And what's going to happen in that ceasefire is Hamas are going yeah. to regroup. They're well, going they to also call for the complete re withdrawal yeah. of Israeli forces. And then, forces. in a year's time, they are going to go back into Israel and kill people. Mm. This is what people are not remembering. And what I think is going to happen is, I think the push behind the scenes, which is what the Americans are quite keen to do, is... Israel's current government does contain some pretty unpleasant, some might yeah. even say fascist elements. They want to undermine those elements and bring in the more sort of centrist elements like the opposition leader Yair Lapid and other former mm. military officers who are the more adults in the room effectively. And to offer this, they're going to dangle the prospect of normalisation with Saudi Arabia. And by the way, most of the Sunni Arab moderate countries are very secretly happy that Israel is taking on these extremists and undermining them. But this is why this started, them. Lauren. Yeah. Because we were about to get normalisation exactly. with Saudi Arabia. Exactly. Because there was a deal to be done. And that isn't talked about enough, I don't think. You know, we are dealing with the only democracy in the Middle East. Well, it really was the precipitating factor behind the whole thing.